distinguished judges, lawyers, public officials, business persons, and entrepreneurs who can give us different perspectives on cutting edge issues affecting law, justice, business, and government. As students, it can be hard to see the law's real world impact. This lecture series brings the law into the classroom and narrows the distance between higher education and everyday life. Today, it is my pleasure to introduce Illinois Supreme Court Justice David Overstreet and to welcome him back to the college for the second time this month. <laughs> Justice Overstreet received his Bachelor of Science degree from Lipscomb University in Nashville and his Juris Doctor degree from the University of Tennessee. He spent his legal career in private practice until his appointment to the Second Judicial Circuit Court in 2007. After being appointed to the bench, Justice Overstreet successfully ran for election in 2008 and was retained in 2014. He was assigned to the Fifth District Appellate Court in 2017 and then elected to serve on that court until he was elected to the Illinois Supreme Court in 2020. In addition to being an accomplished jurist, Justice Overstreet is an established leader in shaping the practice of law in our state. He serves on the Illinois Judicial Conference and is vice chair of the Public Education and Engagement Task Force. He is the Supreme Court liaison to the Supreme Court Board of Admissions to the Bar, Supreme Court Committee on Character and Fitness, the Supreme Court Commission on Access to Justice, the Attorney Registration and Disciplinary Commission, and the Capital Development Board. He has served on several boards and committees related to judicial education, professionalism, and mentoring. Justice Overstreet is the president of the Illinois Judges Association for the 2023-2024 term and previously served on the Illinois Judges Association Board of Directors and as an executive committee member. Please join me in welcoming Justice Overstreet back to the college. Thank you, Dean, um, for the invitation. And it's, it's great to be back here at the law school with you. This is, uh, and I want to thank uh, Professor Salza for the invitation for setting us up. And uh, I enjoyed meeting with his class here, uh, here the, the last hour, and uh, they came dressed to play. So uh, I, I appreciate that. I, I didn't know if everybody would be dressed, but I understand if you're not. So it was good to be with them. I got to talk to Julio out in the lobby beforehand, and uh, I always enjoy uh, being able to engage with, with, with the law students here and, and elsewhere. The, um, this is my third visit. Uh, since I've been a Supreme Court Justice to uh, the law school here. Back a um, year and a half ago, I was invited to meet with uh, some of the uh, students who were involved in the legal clinics and some of their professors, and I, I enjoyed that visit. And then about three weeks ago, I was here um, with a panel of, of lawyers and, and, and other, uh, Judge Holloman was here as well, and um, Laura Bagby from Commission on Professionalism, John Thies, and we talked about the strategic planning uh, of the Illinois courts and uh, gave a presentation on that. I, I enjoyed being with the, the students. But what a crowd. I, I appreciate uh, all of you taking your lunch hour to, uh, to be with me here. You know, the, um, we're going to talk about today th three things. One is the, the inner workings of the Supreme Court. Yeah, and, and, you know, I talk to lawyers and non-lawyers, but, but even lawyers who, who really don't understand you know, the process and, and, and what we do as Supreme Court justices. And, and so um, I hope you find that informative and interesting. Uh, I'll also talk about uh, one of the cases I've authored since I've been on the court, uh, People versus Moon, which, which I think is, is, is very interesting as well and with some of the constitutional issues involved. And then uh, save time for uh, questions and answers. Um, then at the end, hopefully we'll have you know, 15 minutes or so, because I, I want to hear, uh, hear your thoughts and questions. And, but again, it's wonderful to be with you here today. You know, a little bit um, about my, my personal background. I, I went on the court uh, 
December of 2020, and this was the court I was with when I first went on. And uh, we had Chief Justice Ann Burke there in the middle at the time, and then to her right, uh, Mary Jane Tice, who's now the chief. To her left, Rita Garman, Justice Rita Garman from Danville. I'm sure she's been a frequent visitor to the law school here. Uh, Justice Michael Burke, uh, then further to the right, who, who served by appointment for a couple of years, not on the court now. Justice Scott Neville, uh, to the left, uh, the um, and who I still serve with, Justice Neville from Cook County, then Justice Bob Carter, who was uh, from, from Ottawa, Illinois, the third district. And then, then I'm on the, the far left. I come in, I came in as a number six man uh, person uh, on, on the seventh person Supreme Court. Uh, I had one day seniority over Justice Bob Carter. And see, seniority is a big thing, as, as I'll, I'll talk about here in a minute. But, um, you know, I, I'm from Mount Vernon, and that's southern Illinois. Uh, and it's, it's also where the appellate courthouse is in the 5th District. Uh, it was, when I served on the appellate court, it was the southern 37 counties. And now, with redistricting, it's the lower 48, uh, so including Champaign County. Uh, but this courthouse is significant. Uh, built 1854, 1857, and it was originally one of the sites of the Illinois Supreme Court. You know, we've had three, you know, four constitutions now. The Constitution of 1818, when judges uh, were, were just appointed by the governor, as, as I understand it, um, and the justices were, the, the court met in Kaskaskia, one year, and then uh, Vandalia with the capital move the, the next year. But then the Constitution of 1848 established three grand divisions in Illinois with uh, Mount Vernon, uh, I mean the first, and Springfield the second, Ottawa the third district. But So that's what this courthouse was built for. The statue of Abraham, statue of Abraham Lincoln outside uh, represents the fact that he argued a case in front of the Illinois Supreme Court in November of 1859 represent the Illinois Central Railroad. Uh, George McClellan was there as an officer of the railroad, which I find very interesting. This is the last reported case that Lincoln argued in front of the Illinois Supreme Court, and he was prolific. I think at one time he had the record for most arguments. Maybe Big Jim Thompson passed him up on that. But uh, just think about this. this. He was in this courthouse a year before he's elected president, and, uh, you know, then shortly thereafter, McClellan's is general for the Union in the Eastern Theater. And then in 18, five years later, McClellan's running against him for president. They were all in this courthouse. It is the only, and I'm very proud of it, as you can tell, but it is the only courthouse that exists that operates as a courthouse on a daily basis where Lincoln argued a case. Uh, but that is uh, in, in the 5th District. There have been... 124 justices in the Illinois Supreme Court. I came in at number one. 19, just been on the court three years, so there, there's been quite a bit of turnover. The, uh, of course, we sit now in Springfield, uh, and uh, just to, across from the Capitol, uh, I, I heard that, you know, we're, we're one of three co-equal branches of government, and, and, and we invite the legislature over from time to time and for maybe oral arguments, and, and I hear the story of one of the legislators asked, well, where are you located? And we said, across the street. <laughs> but that, that's where we are. We're on the, uh, the east side uh, from the, the Capitol building. Uh, that building uh, was opened in 1908. And, um, you know, since, I think, 1897, the Supreme Court has just sat in Springfield. The, um, what's interesting is we, we live together. Justices do on the third floor. So if you've been to the courtroom, it's on the second floor. The third floor, all the justices have, you know, bedrooms with studies. I mean, we're, we're working while we're there uh, when we're in term and, uh, and a little bit of living area. There's a dining room. We have our meals together. So we're a very collegial bunch in Illinois. We, we got that going for us. Uh, we're, we're unique. I think we are the only state where the justices actually live together during term uh, in the actual courthouse. Map of Illinois, so, uh, you know, after the, uh, you know, I mentioned the 1848 Constitution, then there was the 1870 Constitution, and by the way, that was, the 1870 Constitution set up the appellate courts for the first time, um, and then, then the Constitution of 1970 was our last one. 
the um, there had been no redistricting done since 1970 until here the last couple of years it came about. And so the current map, you see the map um, of the, the various circuits uh, on the um, on the right here. Uh, so I, I come from the second circuit, the Jefferson County is there, and the, the light blue, and, and you're up in the sixth circuit that Champaign County is. Uh, there are 24 circuits, and they're, then they're divided up in the other map showing the judicial districts. In Illinois, there are five judicial districts, and so that's where your appellate courts would sit, and also that's how the Supreme Court justices, uh, where they are either you know elected eventually from. So I you know I joke the fifth district after redistricting is the lower 48, and there's only 102 counties in Illinois, but then uh, the fourth district covers a lot of territory as well, uh, Springfield and on up to uh, Rockford. Uh, the, the third district, you've got Ottawa and some other towns there. And then the, the, the second district now, Lake County and, you know, a lot of the, the collar counties. And then the first district is Cook County. So in, in the, on the Supreme Court, three of the justices come from Cook County, the first district, and then there's one from each of the other districts. We are elected for 10-year terms uh, and up subject to retention votes should we choose to uh, seek retention um, at that point where it requires a 60% yes vote to remain in office. The appellate judges are in the same position, 10-year term, um, and they face retention as well. Circuit judges, in the circuits, you've got circuit judges and associate judges. Circuit judges are elected for six-year terms, sometimes just from the county, and then sometimes a circuit judge at large position, which is what I was. I ran in 12 counties in the Second Circuit. And then you also have associate judges who are uh, appointed by the circuit judges. So we've, we've got a, a good mix in Illinois. And as far as the, the electoral process and my thoughts on that, if you want, someone wants to ask me a question at the end, then we can, we can get into that as well. The, um, again, we're, here's a little outline about uh, how many are on the court and so forth. I, you know, one of the things that is surprising to a lot of people, and, and even though I, I was around Justice Carmeier, my predecessor, a lot, uh, it is amazing the amount of administrative work we do as Supreme Court justices. And with the committees and the boards and commissions we meet with, and I'll, I'll talk in more detail um, here toward the end of, of this portion of the presentation, but uh, we're not just hearing cases, which are is is the most fun part of the job and the, and, and the most critical part of the job, but it, it's also critical our administrative work in trying to, uh, our efforts to improve the legal system for all of our citizens in Illinois. The, uh, we do have an administrative director, Marcia Meese, is the director of the AOIC who uh, operates a vast array of, of staff members to assist us in the administrative duties. You know, we're mostly a court of review, although as you can see from the slide, there are areas that the Constitution provides where uh, we do have original jurisdiction. I've not experienced that to mind. I don't recall that in the three years I've been on the court where we have done that. Um, Mary Jane Tice is our Chief Justice from Cook County. She is, uh, I will say, the right person for the job right now. She's, uh, she really wants to bring in where all of the boards, commissions, and committees with other stakeholders, not just judges, Okay, lawyers and other members of the public are, are talking about the big issues, and um, which uh, I think is, is very important. Uh, here's the current court. Now, what you're going to notice is this picture is uh, it, it's somewhat different from the, the first picture when I was on the court. And, and what's striking in Illinois is until the 1990s, there had never been a female on the Illinois Supreme Court. Mary Ann McMurrow became the first uh, justice on the Illinois Supreme Court from Cook County. I had the privilege of meeting her once, uh, you know, after she had retired. Uh, there had only been one African American on the Illinois Supreme Court, Charles Freeman, and he came along in either the late 90s or early 2000s. And um, so now, after basically 2020, uh, 2022, December, uh, there are five females on the Illinois Supreme Court. 
there are three African Americans. And, and I know on, on the female ratio, you know, there's, there's seven of us, five out of seven. It's the highest ratio of any state in, in the United States. Uh, but, uh, you know, I'm honored to serve with my colleagues. The other thing is, uh, I'm sitting closer to the Chief Justice, you, you might notice now. Uh, so a lot's happened in the last three years. And, and I'm now at number three seniority there, um, you know, looking out, I guess, to your right and, and to her left is uh, Justice Neville, who's number two in seniority. Uh, you, you go, you got, uh, let's see, then Justice Holder White. Now, she's a graduate of U of I Law School, and I heard her pictures on the wall, and I'm sure she's been here a lot. I don't, she might even teach here. I'm not sure, but uh, she's a very proud alumni. And uh, she was appointed, and she, she's actually running for office now. So when I, when I went on the Supreme Court, I was not appointed to that position. It was just an open seat. Uh, but she's, she finds herself in a race, and uh, as does, uh, going to the far right there, sitting next to me is Justice Joy Cunningham from Cook County. And, and she was appointed to Ann Burke's seat. And she is in a contested election now, a primary anyway. And then we go over to the left. The far left where I used to sit, Justice Liz Rochford from the second district in Lake County, and she's someone I've known for a few years, served as an officer of the Illinois Judge Association with. Um, so I'm very happy to have her as a colleague as well. And, and then uh, Justice Mary Kay O'Brien. And I understand she was at the law school not, not too long ago. And uh, she's from um, she's from around LaSalle County uh, there, but she served, she was a legislator legislator at one point, which is an interesting perspective, and then she served on the appellate court in the 3rd District for many years. So, uh, anyway, uh, you know, I'm really proud to serve with all these people, and it, it does not matter. I know the world wants to look at things in a political lens. It does not matter where we come from, our backgrounds, our political backgrounds. We work together, and I, I, I tell you, 100% conviction, that every one of these members are trying to do their best for Illinois, no matter what their background is. So I want to leave that, make sure you get that message from me. Here's the seniority chart. Why does seniority matter? Well, you know, you see where we sit on the bench, but also it matters uh, even things like, uh, well, we're in conference. So th this is a big deal. Uh, we're, we're talking about cases either that we've just heard and we're going to give an impression vote on or maybe opinions when we have an opinion conference. We come back, you know, a term later, and, and when we vote, the least senior member votes first because, uh, we, we, you know, I guess the theory is we don't want them influenced by the more senior members, and then it works its way up to the chief justice. We, we sit in that order in the conference. We actually sit in the dining room. Uh, you know, I'm sitting by the chief, you know, in our meals too, and so, and then even something like the, the bedrooms, um, you know, we get to pick our rooms based on the seniority. And, and I got to tell you, now Justice Neville passed on a room, and I grabbed it. And I, I got a view of the Capitol every morning and every night when I go to bed. And so uh, I'm very grateful. It, 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 I, I really am. That's, that's all I can say about that. Uh, this is, again, some of my uh, Ann Burke and Rita Garm I served with, and Mary Ann McMurrow I did not, but uh, prior female justices. The... Um, <laughs> Terms. We uh, five terms a year: January, March, May, September, November. The second, third weeks of those months, we we typically we come in on the first Monday. We have an opinion conference where we're voting on opinions that have been circulated from uh, one of the prior term. Usually, it's just the most recent. Sometimes the case could drag on a little bit, and and that's when we give the official votes. If if uh, everyone's in agreement, uh, you know to uh, you know, concur, then uh, that, that decision is going to be released probably a week and a half later on the first filing date. Uh, if someone is going to dissent, uh, then we, we figure that out or concurrence. And, and sometimes, you know, the, the magic number is four from the Constitution. It takes four votes to adopt an opinion, and it doesn't matter if there's only, if there's six people who can hear the case because one's not, you know, has a conflict, still the magic number is four. If, uh, if, if the decision is not going to reach that number, then the author will have the opportunity to take a reject, and the chief will assign the opinion to uh, someone who was in the, the majority, as it, as it turned out. There's a grid we use, 
And so basically, it, I mean, it's, it's a random process. The cases were assigned. We, I know what case I'm assigned to be the author before I go to Springfield for term. For example, we're going to be in term in November. We're going to hear 13 cases, uh, and I know which of those cases I'm the assigned author. I'm getting prepared on all of them. I've got four law clerks who work with me, okay, and, and they are all permanent clerks in that they, they, they stay with me. I don't rotate, although I, I like the idea of rotating, but I, I, I've, I've stuck with the permanent clerks so far. But, um, you know, I'm getting uh, uh, memos from them and bench briefs so forth. But, um, but anyway, I, I know which cases I'm going to, I'm supposed to be the author. But again, that could change if, if things develop and take a reject. The, um, also, while we're at term, you know, the, we're, we're going to hear cases. So Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursdays, we're going to hear case, three to four cases in the morning. Starts off earlier in the term, criminal cases. And then civil. We we were we were 24 cases in September. Uh, the majority were criminal. The way it's worked out this term, I think we're hearing four civil, and then nine no four criminal, nine civil cases. The uh, in the afternoons, a lot of times we have conferences with maybe uh, one of our boards and commissions. As far as their their chairmans, they give us an annual report. Perhaps with uh, Marcia Meese, our administrative director. Uh, we have we review matters concerning um, prisoner docket where there are certain motions filed. Uh, uh, ARDC matters where an attorney the, the, through the hearing process there's a recommendation they be disbarred or suspended or what have you, and we look at all that and we vote on it. Uh, character and fitness issues, you know, you're taking the bar exam, but you know there's a red flag. You go through that process. Now, hopefully none of you do, but uh, then then we vote on those matters as well. In between terms, again, we're, I tell you what, what happens on a day-to-day -day basis at the office in Mount Vernon. Every day, I have several petitions for leave to appeal that I, I vote on, or at least bank my vote. The, um, you know, basically, the, um, we, we release our votes all at the same time, but I'll probably have 200 between term and deciding based on Rule 315, whether it's a matter of general importance uh, you know, there's a conflict in the districts, what have you, uh, whether or not I think the court should take that case. Uh, so we take around 7%. I think that was a figure from 2022 of the, the PLAs that have been filed, so that's, that's not many. So that's always going on. Uh, when we get closer to term, now I'm the time, you know, reading briefs and bench memos, getting ready for arguments and also reviewing opinions that are being circulated now. You know, probably had four opinions come to my attention, emailed to me in the, this week, and there will be, be a few more, but those will be voted on at the opinion conference. The, um, anyway, call the docket sheet. You know, hey, you are in front of the Supreme Court, you want to dress up and be on time and be deferential, so that's a... That same. We have a reporter of decisions who works with us to uh, make sure style-wise and site-wise everything is is right with our opinions. And that's Jacob Jost. He sits in on the opinion conferences with us. Um, talked a little bit about opinions being circulated and, and voted on. <coughs> and so that's that is the most fun part of the job, by the way, and the oral arguments and then the discussions regarding the opinions and. As things change with dissents and so forth. Uh, we have filing dates, three filing dates generally after term, um, Thursdays, every other Thursday. But we can have special filing dates. We had, you know, over the summer, uh, between terms, we had cases where it was such public importance, we, we voted on in between terms and, you know, filed them. Uh, one regarding the Safety Act and, you know, what the courts are going to do with that. And then, and then also the... Um, the, the uh, state case on the assault weapons ban, and we render a decision on that. So, uh, you know, the courts know how to enforce those and whether they were held upheld, and they both were. Uh, Perlman order, uh, if, if, if a case doesn't get the requisite four, but let's say it's tied 3-3, three, three, we just render a decision saying, you know, we couldn't come to a decision. It follows basically what the U.S. Supreme Court does, and so, uh, you know, it's not precedential. 
but the law of the case stands from what the appellate court ruled. Uh, supervisory orders, we have that in our toolbox um, where we can direct the appellate court to consider a decision that we rendered recently, for example, and that happens from time to time. Petitions for rehearing, you lose, you know, and we'll have probably three petitions for rehearing that we'll consider to see uh, advocates will um, argue that they, we overlooked or misunderstood this decision. And, uh, you know, rarely, my experience for those overturned, but, but sometimes they are, and, and rarely are the sense issued, although I issued one in a case not too long ago, because I, I thought I needed to say a few more things about it. But um, case filings here, now, those are the, the PLAs are included in that. And keep in mind, we just take 7% of the cases. So we have a lot of motions, motions every day. I've, I've already seen four motions today, email from one of my clerks, you know, some basic things like extensions of time uh, to file a, a, a PLA or a brief. And a lot of times those will go to the, the justice in that district. But sometimes, you know, if it's a case where I need to get the court, full court involved, I'll, I can pass it on. And then there are full court motions by rule as well, uh, as you can see, motions for supervisory order for one, uh, sanctions, uh, bar admission related motions, you can see. Now, I want to talk here, maybe five minutes or something on this. I talked about how important the administrative role uh, we play on the court as far as, we have 33, I think by my count, boards, commissions, or committees. And I'll, I'll tell you what I'm involved with. I'm, I'm very fortunate to be liaison, and as the dean mentioned, board of admissions. And you know, there's a big issue right now on, um, you know, whether we're going to adopt the next gen. And and I've been to several conferences on that. We've got a new director as of the last year, and I helped with, with that process. The uh, and if you take the exam in Illinois, I might even be at the bar exam for, for whatever that's worth. So say hi to me if you, you see me. But uh, character and fitness, which is a component of that, uh, and and I understand uh, Vanessa Williams, the deputy director, uh, will be presenting to 3Ls sometime uh, in the next uh, couple weeks. So I encourage you, if you're 3L, to, to come to that live, uh, if, if you can, or at least see it on tape. Uh, ARDC, I, I'm also the liaison to that, and very important, uh, you know, the, the registration discipline of, of attorneys, but, but also the ARDC is, is really taking a proactive role in trying to help attorneys avoid getting in trouble. Mental health is a big issue in the state, and in all facets of the law, the ARDC is cognizant of that and is, uh, again, trying to be proactive in helping attorneys uh, the RDC, I'll tell you this, you know, we've got the um, AI issue and, and the, the new world and, and how we're going to handle that. Um, the court will be looking at that, but I, I know the ARDC is looking at that as well. The, uh, and I mentioned the Capital Development Board, um, and I, I don't do a whole lot with that. I just kind of get reports on the projects that are going on. But I'm also the uh, liaison to Access to Justice, which, you know, helping the underserved, um, you know, those who can't afford an attorney, it's in, uh, our courts have done a lot based on this commission's work the last 11 years in, uh, you know, self-help forms, navigators, uh, people working with those who do not have an attorney to you know, point them in the right direction. And those efforts will continue full force. But, but all my colleagues have um, five to six of these they're working on. I'm also a member of the Illinois Judicial Conference which is, and I was when I was on the appellate court too, strategic planning body for the court. If you were here for our presentation a few weeks ago, uh, you'll have a, an idea about that. But we, that body has become uh, a, a group that we, the court funnels a lot of issues to and uh, trying to get uh, stakeholders. There are 15 judges, 14 non-judges uh, to get their views on issues. Remote hearings, for example, uh, they played a big role in that. Uh, so I spent a lot, I was in Chicago last week, Monday through Friday. Now it just, it all just happened to come the same week, but I had an event or a meeting with probably four of these bodies that, that I was involved with. And, uh, 
but it's exciting and, and I love it. And, and it, I think it's, it's a very important part of, of what I do as a Supreme Court justice. Let's talk about uh, one of the cases that uh, I'm most proud of uh, my, my short time on the court. And that is uh, People versus Moon. I don't know, did uh, anybody read it? Do you have any homework here? Okay, very good. So, you know, obviously law schools a lot of times emphasize federal law matters and because you've got federal criminal and, you know, maybe intellectual property and antitrust, taxation issues, civil rights. But, but most litigation occurs in state courts, uh, including in, in Illinois. And you know, common law or statutory legal lawsuits involve torts, personal injury, property, uh, contracts, criminal cases, of course, just some of the cases that arise in our certain courts. Um, and, and most of these areas are regulated by, by law, you know, in the um, statutory law or, or, or the, the common law. Um, you're, you learned or will learn uh, from your evidence and um, trial practice uh, classes of the importance of preserving your record on appeal. Um, to a review court by making temporary objections or motions in limine to bar evidence at trial so that your client does not forfeit their right to raise the point on appeal. In Illinois state practice, in a jury case, a lawyer must make that objection at trial to admissible evidence or improper procedures and raise the issue in a post-trial motion. Unlike the federal courts, the Illinois courts distinguish between waiver and forfeiture of rights. Waiver involves the intentional relinquishment of a right, such as entering into a stipulation. Forfeiture involves the affirmative failure to take certain actions, failing to object to evidence, trial, or proposed jury instruction. Um, however, as I'm, I will discuss, some issues are so essential or fundamental to the proper functioning of our trial system that they cannot be forfeited in Illinois under the plain error doctrine. As you recall, we'll learn the plain error doctrine provides that under certain limited circumstances, the failure to make a timely objection, particularly in criminal cases, can still be remedied. And now I turn your attention to the case of State of Illinois versus Moon, decided in April 2022. Moon underscores the importance of Illinois state court constitutional and non-constitutional law jurisprudence, especially for criminal defense lawyers. And uh, I had the privilege of authoring the opinion on behalf of the unanimous Supreme Court. From a, a criminal uh, defendant's uh, standpoint, Moon has bad facts. Specifically, the defendant Moon was convicted of, by jury of striking a minor child with an object that left redness, swelling, and belt buckle shaped marks. Despite these facts, the significant legal principles of a right to an impartial jury mattered to the seven justices. Regarding this principle, the law is complicated and required a detailed legal recitation, as evidenced by the 30-page opinion. Integral to the legal analysis is that the state of Illinois administers two oaths to jurors, one to all the prospective jurors, and then a second oath to the actual jurors selected. So I, I had the good fortune of, as a circuit judge, presiding over jury trials. Uh, I think I had 25 civil, five criminal jury trials, and, and that was obviously an exciting part of uh, my work as a circuit judge. The first oath, known as the voir dire oath, is administered by the clerk of the court. The purpose of the voir dire oath is to impress upon jurors the importance of agreeing to several principles of, of a criminal case known as the Zare principles from a 1984 Supreme Court case. In Moon, each prospective juror was asked and accepted that, one, the defendant is presumed innocent of the charges against him or her, the presumption of innocence, too. The presumption of innocence is not overcome unless and until the jury is convinced beyond a reasonable doubt that the defendant is guilty. Three, the defendant carries the burden throughout the case of proving the defendant's guilt beyond a reasonable doubt. Four, defendant is not required to prove his or her innocence or present any evidence at all and may rely upon the presumption of innocence. And five, the defendant does not have to testify and that election cannot be used against him or her. Now, all the prospective jurors also agreed to the additional standard principles that they would follow the laws given, be fair to both sides, decide the case without sympathy, bias, or prejudice to both sides, and await all the evidence, arguments, and jury instructions before reaching a verdict. But that agreement was given during the voir dire oath. 
okay, before they had been selected. The second no oath, known as the trial oath, is administered by the trial judge. Its purpose is to impact the state of minds of the selected jurors, to promise to lay aside any existing impressions or opinions, and to render a verdict based on the evidence. This admonition helps to ensure the criminal defendant's constitutional right to an impartial jury. Stated differently, this solemnity gives the defendant a comfortable assurance that he or she will have a fair and impartial trial. The state stipulated that the circuit court did not administer the trial oath. Although Moon's counsel did not object contemporaneously to the unsworn jury, this error was included in a post-trial motion required by rule. Although admitting his error, the trial judge nevertheless denied the motion for a new trial because the defendant allegedly failed to show any prejudice and the other jury instructions allegedly cured the error. On appeal, the First District Appellate Court in a split 2-1 decision affirmed the denial of a motion for a new trial, concluding that the defendant forfeited the unsworn juror argument by failing to object contemporaneously at trial and that the error did not rise to the level of plain error, especially since the evidence of child abuse was not closely balanced and allegedly did not affect the fairness of the trial. In disagreeing, the dissenting justice emphasized that the defendant had a constitutional right to an impartial jury and reversible error occurred because the trial oath was not administered, regardless of the strength of the evidence against Moon or the lack of showing of prejudice by the defendant. The next segment of the Moon opinion has many layers of legal analysis with federal and state law considerations, and because of time constraints, I'll try to simplify it. The plain error rule is an exception to forfeiture principles, allowing the reviewing court to examine defendants' procedural errors. Although not a constitutional principle, the rule has its roots in the same soil as due process. The courts invoke the plain error rule in their discretion in two circumstances. One, in a case where the evidence is closely balanced and where a clear or obvious error occurred, regardless of its seriousness, and that error alone threatens to tip the scale against a potentially innocent defendant, known as the closely balanced evidence prong, or two, regardless of the closeness of the evidence, when the clear or obvious error is so serious that it affects the fairness of the defendant's trial and challenges the integrity of the judicial system known as the substantial rights prong. The Illinois Supreme Court opinion concluded that the unsworn jury issue was a clear or obvious error because of the failure to administer the trial oath. When addressing the substantial rights prong, errors that fall within this purview are presumptively prejudicial errors. There are errors that must be remedied because they affect the defendant's right to a fair trial and threaten the integrity of the judicial process. The second prong, plain error, is labeled a structural error because it necessarily renders a criminal trial unfair or is an unreliable means of determining guilt or innocence. Structural errors identified by U.S. Supreme Court cases that deprive criminal defendants of basic protections include a complete denial of counsel, a denial of self-representation at trial, racial discrimination in the selection of a grand jury, and a defective reasonable doubt instruction. Significantly, as Moon states from a state constitutional law standpoint, the Illinois Supreme Court is not limited to the class of structural cases identified by the U.S. Supreme Court. But differently, the Illinois Supreme Court may deem an error structural under state law, regardless of whether it is deemed structural under federal law. The Moon Court then analyzed whether the circuit court's failure to administer a trial oath to the jury was a structural error. This analysis rested upon the defendant's right to an impartial jury, which is firmly rooted in American jurisprudence and guaranteed by both the U.S. Constitution, Sixth Amendment, stating in all criminal prosecutions the accused shall enjoy the right to a speedy and public trial by an impartial jury, and also the 1970 Illinois Constitution, Article 1, Section 8, stating, in criminal prosecutions, the accused shall have the right to trial by an impartial, or Section 1, Section 13, stating the right to trial by jury as heretofore enjoyed shall remain inviolate. These two Illinois Constitutional Bill of Rights appeared substantively in the 1818, 1848, 1870 constitutions. Therefore, the Supreme Court concluded under each constitution the right of trial by jury was as existed at common law. Significantly, we focused on the as heretofore language 
in case law commenting that the right to a jury trial was broader under the state constitution than the federal constitution. The Illinois Supreme Court further concluded that the practice of swearing the jury with a trial oath was firmly entrenched in the common law when each Illinois constitution was adopted. The Moon opinion cited similar holdings in U.S. Supreme Court cases, other state cases, and the English common law cases, wherein the essential elements of the common law trial by jury was preserved under the as heretofore enjoyed language reflected in the current Article I, Section 13 language of the Illinois Constitution. As the Moon opinion states, swearing jurors with a trial oath directly impacts the state of mind of the selected jurors because the oath is essentially a promise to lay aside one's impressions of opinions and render a verdict based on the evidence presented at trial. And the solemnity calling the jurors before the defendant and the court gives the defendant reasonable assurance that he or she is to have a fair and impartial trial. Despite this conclusion, the Illinois Supreme Court was still required to decide whether the second prong of the plain air doctrine constituted structural error and deprived the defendant of the constitutional right to an impartial jury. We concluded that it was structural error of such gravity that it threatens the judicial process and is a protection guaranteed in our state constitution. Since swearing the jury is part of the trial framework, the complete failure to administer the trial oath was concluded, we concluded it's difficult, if not impossible, to measure because the error concerns the subjective frame of mind of the jurors. We further concluded that the double jeopardy clauses of the U.S. Constitution, Amendment 5, and the Illinois Constitution, Article 1, Section 10, support our conclusion that the failure to administer the trial oath is a structural error and mandates automatic reversal. Under federal state case law, Jeopardy did not attach until all jurors were accepted and sworn, and that did not occur, occur here. So, although the criminal code does not specifically set forth what should be in the, the trial uh, oath, um, we found that there are essential elements preserved in our Constitution and includes solemnity, a decision based on the law and evidence in, in a fair, true verdict. More specifically, the trial oath requires that the jurors commit to a solemn duty to lay aside their impressions or opinions, carefully deliberate on the matter at issue, and render a verdict based on the law and evidence in court, thus preserving the defendant's constitutional right to an impartial jury. We conclude that to pass constitutional muster under our state's constitution, a jury must be sworn with an oath that substantially incorporates these elements. Upholding a conviction before an unsworn jury would undermine the integrity of the very foundation of our system of criminal justice that foundation being the fundamental right to an impartial jury. This error in and of itself cast doubt upon the reliability of the judicial process. And, you know, in conclusion, seven justices of the Illinois Supreme Court reversed the decision of the First District Appellate Court and remanded for a new trial. Uh, thank you for allowing me to talk about that case. I, I meant to allow more time for questions, but let's get to it. Any questions you might have? I remember you from being here three weeks ago, but I, I welcome your question. I appreciate your, your willingness to step up. So, go ahead. Uh, thank. Is it on? That's on. Yeah. It's on. Is it on? I thought it was me for a moment. I was happy. <laughs> okay. Um, thank you for coming, Justice, and thank you for your presentation. I'm wondering, you mentioned it briefly, I'm wondering why the Illinois Supreme Court and a lot of state courts writ large have moved away from the term clerk system. Because we have several people that teach here that have uh, clerked at state Supreme Courts, as well as several lawyers I met in practice who clerked for the Illinois Supreme Court who really valued the experience. Right, thank you. And you know what? I, I'll tell you my personal experience, but but I agree with you. I, I think in some ways I'm making a mistake here. But what, what happened, I came on the court in December 2020, and I'd been on the appellate court. Uh, I had I had three law clerks from that, and then I, I, I also uh, hired a law clerk from Justice Carmeier's staff to a little continuity there, my predecessor. And there, there's been a couple changes, and but there are other clerks who either work for me who I knew their outstanding work in the appellate court. And... and I, I guess for selfish reasons, I grabbed them, and, 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 and they're, they're excellent uh, clerks and serve the system well. However, I do agree with you in, in, in that in, in if I can find, if, if I have someone leave and the timing is right, I, I like what Justice Garmin did. 
because I know she had two permanent clerks and two rotating clerks that would work with her for two year periods. And the experience that the students, the, the new lawyers would get from that and the justice from, from getting uh, that perspective and uh, fresh blood, what have you, I think is, is very valuable. Um, so I apologize. I, I haven't figured out a way to do it. And, and I think all of my colleagues are using permanent clerks right now. But uh, I, you know, if it's, you know, if, if I last long enough and, and somebody leaves me, and I'm sure they will, um, I, I am going to do my best to bring in uh, rotating clerk, because I, I think you're right, and, and, and I, I, I do feel bad about not giving students that opportunity. I, having said that, now I do have externs that, uh, that I hire in the summer, and you know, I don't pay them, uh, but, but sometimes their, their system, you know, there are other programs that, that these students are paid, and, and I'm not sure what the setup is as far as the uh, you know, coordination with credit in University of Illinois, I need to find that out. But I've, I've had law clerks, uh, externs, uh, the last th three summers. I had three from SIU last year, but the previous summer I had a couple from WashU and one from the University of Virginia, and, and then I had two the prior year. But, uh, of course, I live in Mount Vernon, you know, and so that, that may be a hindrance to anybody who might be interested. But I, I actually, you know, I don't know what I'm going to do this summer. And I, I've had one person approach me, and I'll get together with my clerks and see what kind of interest we have, but uh, if, if there, any of you are interested, please get a hold of my office and, and, and we can talk. I'd love to have you come down and meet my staff, myself, and then um, see if there's something we can, we can work out. Um, Thank you, Your Honor. You're welcome. Yes, Professor. Uh, two questions unrelated. The first one being, you mentioned at the outset, uh, we should maybe circle back on it, the difference between elected judges versus appointed judges, your views on that particular issue. The second one would be uh, the court has, although they're in turn normally in Springfield, sometimes they ride the circuit. If you could give us your impressions on, on that aspect as well. Great. Riding the circuit, I, I got to experience that on the court in May. We heard two cases at Chicago State University and uh, 400 people were there, students and, and other folks too, but um, that's value. The court has tried to do that once a year uh, or once every two years for a number of years. The COVID hit, so that interrupted things. But I, I know I, I attended the one at Lewis and Clark and Godfrey in 2019 just as a spectator. Um, it, it's very valuable. We, we want to bring the court to the public and especially students. So we will continue to do that. I, I understand the court was here maybe in 2018. And so, um, you know, you, you won't be here, but at some point I'm sure we'll be back uh, to the law school. But I, I think it's very important uh, that we continue that. And, and it, was, it was quite the charge, you know, hearing a case in front of 400 people. So it was, uh, uh, I, I really enjoyed that. The, uh, on on the, the way we select judges in Illinois, you know, I can see the pros, con you know, I, of course, I, I survived and, and prevailed in three campaigns. So I'm, I'm, I'm grateful for that. And, uh, you know, a couple, couple of campaigns, I, one thing you run as a judge, and the good thing you're not, if, as opposed to run for Congress, the only thing you're supposed to do is say, here's who I am, um, here's my, you know, background, my experiences, uh, and I promise to work hard and be faithful to the law and the Constitution. You know, that's, you, you say much beyond that, and, and, you're, you, and you start sending signals to how you're going to vote on a case, and that's against the judicial code of conduct, and, and and that's a, that's, a, that's a bad thing. It's a horrible thing. The, um, you know, ideally, all judges would be selected by merit, right? And there are states that have systems where they have committees appoint. Uh, my only uh, concern with, with that method is somebody's still doing an appointment. And, you know, I guess if you have the right committee, you're going to get the best people, hopefully. Uh, but I'm always concerned about a political element involved. You know, if the governor's selecting, I don't care what party they are. You know, then, then you've got a political element if that's part of the process. So, in some ways, I think it's still okay um, to elect, give people the right to have a say in who at least part of their judges are. Um, although, quite frankly, if, you know, if we, would, if we keep that system, uh, nonpartisan ballot would make a whole lot more sense because 
we might run with a R or D by our name, but when we're on the court, that goes aside. And to the extent there's a per um, perception that it doesn't, then uh, then we're in trouble. And obviously, we're we're in an era, and based on some things that happened with the U.S. Supreme Court, especially where the public confidence in the judiciary is, uh, I don't know if it's at an all-time low, but it's it's lower than it needs to be. And so uh, the, the election, you know, the fact that we elect judges is plays in that somewhat. I, um, I'll be honest with you. Uh, I'm glad my election seasons are over. Perhaps I'll have a retention campaign in seven years. Um, that, that's usually a different animal. It's supposed to be. Um, but there is some value in getting out and meeting people. We can serve them, so that's just, you know, I, does that affect how I rule on cases? No, but I, I don't know. I, I think I just think there's some intrinsic value of getting out and meeting people you want to serve. Good afternoon, Your Honor. I was wondering, maybe using the People v. B, B Moon case as an example, how you approach deciding a case from the moment that you start reading the briefs till writing the opinion if you were the assigned author on that case. Okay. Excellent question. So, you know, I'm, I'm getting ready now to, to prepare for the 13 cases we're going to hear, reading the, you know, the, the briefs and bench memos, and I, I'm starting to form some impressions. But I want to stress how important to me oral arguments are. You know, I always get these questions at the Lawyers Association luncheons, has oral argument really matter? Yes, it, it, it certainly can, because a good oral advocate, now they need to have it in their brief, they need to make the arguments there, but they can clarify, he or she can clarify the issues, the, the essential issues to a case in oral argument. You know, what the justices are thinking by their questions um, or their concerns, and I have absolutely gone in with sort of a, an impression before the oral arguments and came out the other side. And I know my colleagues have too, because what happens is we go into the we've not we've not talked about the cases until we go into the conference room after we've heard the oral arguments. We hear four one morning. At the end of the morning, we meet in the conference and we we have a discussion. We give impression votes. They're not binding, and so we make our impressions. Then some one of us has been designated the author, and they will they'll listen to everyone, but then they'll circulate the opinion as they see fit. And then, you know, sometimes uh, I, I may be on one side, I, I get the opinion circulated, and it is uh, persuasive. And I, I can change my mind from the conference, too, and then vote for an adopted opinion, and sometimes I'm for, and someone's dissenting, and then they, they circulate. I think, wait a minute, they've got a point. So it's not that I'm wishy-washy, but, but, I, but I can change my mind, and, and, and I am open-minded, and, and I believe my colleagues are, so... The, the process is very interesting, from oral arguments to conference to the opinions being circulated to the opinion conference, and then to separate writings being circulated. Thank you. Well, okay. Now he, yeah, he thought he was called on first, so he was. Uh... <laughs> Thank you for being here, Your Honor. I'm wondering how does it feel like authoring an opinion that you know will affects future cases potentially hundreds of years into the future. <laughs> now, I'm very proud to be a part of that process. And, and, and in this case that you know, I, I discussed, I, I love history and, and the fact that we you know, went back and looked at the common law and, and constitutional issues from the past. Um, I just, uh, you know, I don't want to say it's my baby because it's the whole, but I'm very proud of, of this case. and, and, and and being involved in, in you know, Illinois history and, and shaping the law and doing my best. And, and even when I write a dissent, um, doesn't prevail. Uh, but, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm proud of those, ha you know, having my voice heard on that. And, you know, some, you know, on some issues you write a dissent and maybe the court changes their mind 30 years later. And others, they, they won't. But uh, it's, it's an aspect of the job that I hadn't really thought about before I came on, but I, I appreciate more now. Got a couple back there, here, and there, I guess. We'll, we'll alternate, male, female, <laughs> then, we'll, then we'll go back. Okay. Hi, 
Hi. Um, first of all, thank you for coming to speak to us, Your Honor. Stand up. I can't hear you here. Yes. Stand up. Yes. Hi. Um, Hi. Thank you for coming to speak to us, Your Honor. Um, I was just wondering what are some common characteristics that you or other um, Illinois Supreme Court justices specifically look for when hiring clerks? <laughs> well, you know, excellent writing skills and, and research skills, but the, but the writing is is paramount. The uh, the ability to uh, work with, with with other clerks and because it's a collaborative effort as well. Like I'll, I'll have a clerk who will, um, you know, I'll, I'll work with them and give direction and, and they come up with a draft and then they'll, they'll, before whatever their handiwork is, gets back to me, they'll they'll circulate among the other clerks and they, they work together. But, but obviously um, someone, you know, you know, has no agenda, open mind, they, they want to, you know, follow the law as best they can, and then, and then follow my, you know, we, we have discussions, and, and, and I value their opinions, but then, then I give direction, and, and then they go with it, you know, and sometimes they come back with some, I have had, uh, where I've given a direction, they come back, and it's like, nah, I don't buy this, maybe I'm wrong, <laughs> write it the other way, and, and that's more persuasive, but uh, writing skills, you know, ability to work with people, including me, which, which I think fairly easy, okay. Thank you, Your Honor. Um, oh, is that working? No. Okay. Try it. Yes. <laughs> Hello? No. You got to stand. Oh, yes, can't hear that at all. Um, no. Thank you, Your Honor. I, I had a question about the kind of unique living arrangements, communal living arrangement. <laughs> I'm curious how that factored into your decision to uh, run for that office and how you see it affecting potential candidates when they're weighing whether or not to put their hat in the ring. Well, I don't. I guess I did have a clue, but I had never been up there. It didn't weigh into my decision at all. Um, it, it's just a bonus. It's just it's a, it's gravy. But uh, I remember I was in 2019. I went to an event, the State Library to honor legal luminaries, and they were also giving tours of the Illinois Supreme Court building. And, and I'd, I, I mean, I'd been in the courtroom. I, I did not argue a case there, but I'd been there for several functions. They were also giving tours of the third floor, and in 2019. I knew Justice Carmeier had an idea he was going to retire, and, and, and he's been very good to me. He appointed me different things and gave me opportunity, and I knew I wanted to run for his seat. Well, I decided I wasn't going to go on the tour toward the third floor until I lived there, and, you know, it, it worked out. But, uh, no, that, that had nothing to do with, with my decision. <laughs> yes. So... The Supreme Court renders, you know, Illinois Supreme Court renders some decisions, and you have penned some dissents that people don't always agree with, and there's always criticism and people that get upset. How do you handle that criticism, and how do you avoid letting it affect you either mentally, you know, sort of the everybody doesn't like me mindset, or politically that I need to change my opinions to fit in or reflect what people want? Yeah. Well, I can't. I can't do that. And and we're all we're all human. And, and we were, you know, you know, we, we, I see what's going on around me, so I'm not, you know, it's not like I have blinders on, but being a judge, if, if you're not impartial and you can't put aside that, and I know it, it can be a challenge, but if you can't put aside that, then you shouldn't be wearing the robe. And so, so I, I know whether I'm in the majority or dissent, uh, I'm going to be criticized, and that's okay. That's America, right? And so, um, you know, I, I, I like people to like me, but 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 I know people aren't going to agree with me, and and I, I don't. It it doesn't really bother me. Um, you know, I I do learn to if there are situations politically charged environment or meetings that depending on what's going on, like, you know, sometimes maybe I just need to stay away, and and I exercise that restraint over the past year because I knew we had a couple big decisions, and there were, you know, I was invited to some things that if I showed up, it just yeah, I don't need to hear that, and I don't need people coming up and talking to me about it. And, um, so I, I do try to exercise discretion in that manner. But uh, no, and I don't, you know, as far as colleagues, you know, we're going to have different opinions. And, you know, I get people ask me, well, it must be tough working with a Chicago judge, you know, you know that kind of stuff. You know, I'm from Southern Illinois, and, and, I, and, and, and I actually I say, no, actually they're great people. And, and, and I don't, you know, and, and you look at decisions, and I don't care, you know, you look at what party we were from or what, most cases, you can't tell who's who. 
you know, what their background is by decision. You know, some, sometimes, it, sometimes, you know, decisions play out where, where maybe it is geographic or political, but that's, that's not the point. It's not the purpose. And, uh, and so I don't, you know, if I 